Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to Tier No, the Lessons of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mokalover, and right now we're taking a good look at the Far Eastern Soviet Socialist Republic. Last time we unified the Far East, but now we're going to continue with, uh, what is this called? The Yagods China. Through carefully political maneuvering and countering every move of our naive opposition in the party, our general secretaries managed to secure unrivaled power in Irkutsk. In a careful purge, the administration of the new state now is left entirely to Yagoda and his allies with the choice of party officials that remain stuck in obsolete positions designed to keep them from true power. Now the USSR united politically and his reeminent rivals in ditches or gulags. It is time for the dominant Yagoda to enact his philosophy, the Yagodza China. Yagoda's China. To epitomize Yagoda's belief in one word would be order. Through order he believes comes prosperity and stability. One can understand then that the situation in the former USSR displeases him immensely, and has only cultivated these feelings. Now it is time to realize Yagoda's dream and reunite Russia under the banner of order. Give more state influence, stability, and additional reforms. I want to go down here a little bit more just because we reduce the strain, and we also get army professionalism. This is nice, and this one would reduce the strain as well, but it is what it is. Um, I would prefer to get more army professionals anyways, but reform the bureaucracy, or secure securocracy. Yeah, the mach machine of the USSR ambles, or ambles along despite the chaos of civil war. But it is clear to Yagoda that it is far from operating at maximum capacity. Within the ranks of the NKVD, there's a disease festering and growing. Its malignance a hamper to the security of the motherland and her loyal citizens. This was more than proven when thousands deserted the Union for that traitor Selblin. We must rip out this tumor from the ranks of the single most important organ of our administration, and ensure it is unable to grow any stronger, preventing it from endangering the safety of our nation once again. To be attacked are the issues of corruption and bureaucratic excess that have held back the NKVD, NKVD from reaching the heights that we desire. A secret subcommittee is to be created to explore corruption, locating who those who skim money off the top and target their political rivals. Lists of these individuals are to be sent to Yagoda for approval of removal as part of the most recent purge. A separate subcommittee has been approved to investigate the issues of overwhelming bureaucracy, one that Yagoda firmly believes is paralyzing its effectiveness. Already these measures are starting to see progress, and with any luck this will continue for the safety and stability of our new union. Great. And we can go ahead. Oh, the affairs of the union. The USSR has endured in the form. Oh, well, actually, I actually probably need to click on that one first. In the form of our statement, the Presidium and Central Executive Committee of the Soviet Union both make their home in Irkutsk and exist as a continued legislative authority within our state. There's two factions, state and party. Oh, the, and we still do this one with the state. Okay, that's fine. Well, we did pretty well with the state. Uh, we get more foreign citizenship increased. Purge the party faction. We need at least 90 for that, so we still got to kill off the party. Professionals and judiciary, academic base. Uh, let's see, professionalism. The state has. Oh, well, we could probably do that one. That's actually not too bad. If industrial efficiency is not bad either, let's do this one since we get it anyways. And we not have. We do not currently have a lot to do with our PP. The new court, following the consolidation of state authority in the person of Genrik Yagoda, and supported by the status factions surrounding him, numerous reforms intended to eliminate corruption and strengthen government organs were announced. Though couched in bureaucratic language and thus obscured from many, perhaps no were as significant as a proposal to drastically alter the procedure and requirements for entering the Soviet judiciary, whether as judge law or otherwise. For many years, and indeed for as long as anyone could remember, loyalty to the party was considered critical for both entry and advancement, with legal qualifications often of secondary concern. Such a system naturally eroded public confidence in the socialist ideal of equal justice and encouraged corruption besides no longer though. At the personal insistence of General Secretary Yagoda, the entire system is to be professionalized. Strict guidelines for required qualifications uh, will be developed. Systems of licensing examined and overhauled if necessary and present officials found to be unqualified removed. In this fashion, the legitimacy of the Soviet justice will be ensured. In the eyes of both the populace and the world, the state must have a competent, effective, and unbiased socialist judiciary. And the state, of course, is what Genrik Yagoda says it what it is. The state must value competence, rewards for service. <clears throat> Those that serve the security interests of our nation to the fullest deserve certain compensation for the continued loyalty and good service. The General Secretary himself has approved pay raises, as well as bonuses to those who demonstrate the values of the motherland best. In addition to members of the civil, security, and military services, citizens who assist the NKBD as informants by giving tips, leading to arrests, or by proving their devotion in other fashions are entitled to reward their incentivized rewarded to incentivize civilian participation in state security. This has had a twofold effect of increasing loyalty, as well as the strengthening of the security apparatus and expanding its reach. While rewards are given, it is important to ensure that previous issues with corruption are dodged and so the subcommittee investigating corruption is to be maintained to ensure the integrity of the NKVD and in turn the security of the true successor of the Union.
and we're going to keep boosting up. We're not going to cut this down at all because our supplies are still not looking super great, especially guns and uh, anti-tank and artillery too. So if we cut it down, we would get less output. We can actually spend more to get more output, but I think we're kind of okay. The biggest issue that we have currently is manpower. Oh, like a thief in the night, Major Sherbina carefully looked over his notes. The family matriarch had ratted out their family patriarch for previous membership in the Russian fascist party. The patriarch had announced his own son for listening to bootleg western records. The son, in turn, had announced his mother for prostitution, a parasitic form of non-labor income. The major shook his head. Your orders, Comrade Major? Over, said the squad leader over his radio. His NKVD agents were in place to breach the door on the family's apartment. They just needed final confirmation on who they would apprehend. Take the three of them. Put them in separate cells when you get here. I'll have my boys at the office type up something for each of them to sign. You know which methods to use if they refuse. And one more thing, yes, Comrade Major, over. At least try to take them alive this time, Comrade. Comrade Yagoda would hate for us to have wasted valuable paper. Over. Of course, Ma Comrade Major. Over now. Cool. And what credit, what credit is due? Universal policing coverage. It hurts our cost, but get more daily PP. I like that. Influence. Um, let's go with pay for mid-level and low-level bureaucrats shall be increased, costing $35 million. Oh, that's not bad. Let's do a tiny bureaucratic oversight to reduce our administrative strain. The subcommittee investigating the state bureaucracy has turned up with interesting results. A memorandum, suspiciously authored by some of Yogoda's closest political allies, have suggested that the state, and therefore the NKVD, take closer and more hands-on controls of these matters. Increased oversight as well as increased accountability has therefore been approved by the General Secretary's stamp, and now all matters of state bureaucracy have been made openly available to the NKVD. This will serve to increase our control over state affairs and create a more streamlined state approach. Corruption, excess, and waiting times will also, will also all be cut down on the aforementioned accountability forces, public servants. Uh, forces public servants to not cut corners and work according to strict state deadlines. A culture of work, love of work, and fulfillment for the state work will be fostered and will be the backbone of the new nation. Very cool. I don't know. I keep going to the right side here. Uh, let's see. Proletarian dictatorship forever? Yes. And anything else? I mean, this stuff is all nice. Uh, poverty does improve. I do want to get that out pretty quickly. Anything over here? Not too much. So credit where it is due. While Yagoda and his faction may now find themselves rightfully dominant in the Soviet government, bridges must be built between Yagoda and what remains of the party faction. We believe that a good way to begin to mend relations would be an official acknowledgement of the party's past role in building the Union. In doing so, we would be singling out their antiquated nature, therefore sidelining them, and ending the conflict between these two factions. We believe that this is a major step in any of the political instability that has paralyzed our attempts at reuniting the Union, and now provide us with a base from which to create a new Russia. By uniting our government, we can start to focus on the real fight and turn our focus outwards. Glory towards the well, towards the glory of the Soviet Union. Not glory towards the Soviet Union, but towards the glory of the Soviet Union. Wow. 1.7 a day is pretty darn nice. I like that a lot. And we do have coffee here to keep us nice and warm. Which is great. The termination. Goznak executive Igor Ganeyev had gone into his annual performance review expecting to be a piece of cake. Tort his own horn a little bit, slipped the HR man a fifth of fine brandy, shared some cigarettes and called it a day, but when he had walked into the office and saw a man in a blue top peak, peaked cap sitting at his desk, all the color drained from his face. Comrade Ganayev, and our investigations have found significant discrepancies b between throat figure puts, or throat put figures at the Dudak and the Kubaka silver mines and the amount of minted silver bullion that your ministry deposits into our reserves each month. The discrepancies first emerged when you received your executive post. How do you account for this? Igor tried to think on his feet. He blamed the Ministry of non ferrous Metallurgy. He blamed the Mafia. He blamed the German spies. He deflected it to anyone he could. None of it seemed to phase an NKVD agent at his desk. All he did was sigh, shake his head, and take notes from his little book eventually. He put up his hand to silence Igor and spoke up. Comrade Ganayev, your guilt was determined prior to our meeting. My inquiry here is to simply to see whether or not you can provide us the names of your co-conspirators. Unfortunately, you have seen fit to waste the people's commissariat's time with your evasive drivel. So let me be frank with you, comrade. The agent leaning closer. If you have stolen the people's silver, we will fill you with the people, people's lead. But performance unsatisfactory. Employee terminated. Very cool. Rewards for public servants. If you like to be about better industrial equipment, please go right ahead. And that is the best one to get. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Well, one of the best ones. <clears throat> As we increase our expectations for our public servants, Yagoda has deemed it necessary to increase salaries for public servants. In addition, those that show exemplary work in their respective fields are entitled to extra compensation in the form of non-monetary rewards, such as vacation time, watches, and even nicer apartments. The cornerstone of this is to be the Antonovite Movement, so named after the exemplary, exemplary, oh, my apologies for mispronunciations, exemplary, 
public worker Klavdi Antonovich. He consistently shows an ability to, re to organize the inner workings of the Union. His dedicated work is an example to all those who have the honor of offering their time in the support of the new Russian civil administration, and so he's been elevated to the head of the movement. He his precedent shows all the public servants of the USSR that to be an Anatolovite is, is to do great work in the name of the state and reunification. My apologies, that took me a lot of time to read, and I had a lot of mispronunciations. Oh, my goodness. I need to improve myself. We'll go straight for uh, this one next. Cool. Oh, and it looks like... Oh, wow. The West WRF versus Comey? Oh, uh, Comey's probably not going to have a good time. Oh, well. Antonovite. Cool. And then, revitalized economic plan might not be bad. I really want to get this stuff done, but I want to get this stuff done first. Ooh, oh, but let's get some technology done first, shall we? Yes, we shall. Right side, thank you. How are we building? Building still okay? Still okay. Not great. Universal... Uh, Policing coverage. It must be ensured in the creation of a new, stronger motherland that the influence of the state must be able to reach every inch of our state equally. We cannot allow the cities to be over policed nor the villages under policed, and limitations have been created to ensure that numbers proportional to population are established. It is in this way that we will show the people of Russia that we are not like the bandits that, we have, that have robbed them, and not like the warlords who have divided and oppressed them. We, the true heirs of the Union, are here to bring back the peace, prosperity, and stability from before the war, and must, through our actions, show the people our values. Establishing a uniform system of law enforcement is the first step towards legitimizing or claim to all of Russia. Very good. You got slightly more political power and from security service to data cohesion and a little bit more coffee. Ah, the good life. It had been good a year for Ivan the Grashov. By working for Gostomonsten, the state committee for prices, he knew the legal price of every single item in the USSR. And ever since General Secretary Yagoda had raised his and every other civil servant's salary, he'd been able to forward much more of these items. His dinner table never lacked meat, and his new car was never out of gas. The car was his proudest purchase. Even with his new salary, he'd also have to save up to afford it. And then there was a waiting list in all the hoops that he had to jump through to get an American car imported into Siberia, by, but by New Year's, he was a proud owner of a new Ford. That New Year's Eve, he decided to show it off to all his co-workers at Goskomsten. He revved the engine and did donuts in the front yard, then he invited his favorite colleague to go on a car ride down the street of Kutsk. It was frowned upon by the police, but he'd earned this. You go to himself and approve his salary, and it's time he lived well and fast once. Pity he'd also spent a bit on that new salary on fine and ported cognac that night. Such is a price of luxury. <laughs> Very cool. Centralized security services. While the NKVD is strong, isolated incidents have been proven that we are not as in control as we would like to think. In response to this, we have decided to consolidate our power and centralize the NKVD further, delegating less, ensuring that everyone is directly accountable, and putting our allies in positions of practical power while our enemies sit in prison at best and in meaningless offices at worst. Central power and authority are key tenets of Yagoda's philosophy, and seeing it not fully carried out in his own base of power has made him suspicious that his government is not as unified as he thought he had made it. Reorganize the NKVD is the first of many measures to better realize. This, his dream, and this dream. Cool. Three billion in debt, no concern of us. Because everything here is actually improving quite a bit. Look at that. Academic base is looking pretty good. Uh, research facilities not too bad. Agriculture is looking very good. We're going to get a boost up very soon. We're at basic mechanization. We'll go to mass mechanization soon. For slightly more consumer goods, better recruitable population factor, monthly population, factory output, dockyard output, even division training time. Poverty is slowly getting better. Industrial equipment is slowly getting better as well. Expertise is going up nicely. And our professionalism is also going up. Nice. All good stuff. And then, the unstoppable march of progress. And so it begins. The United USSR, and now more powerful and with more potential than ever, collectively has taken its first step in what posters, bulletins, what posters, bulletins, and speeches have determined and deemed the most important battle in Russian history. Its reunification against the menace of the Reich. And Russia shattered by infighting and external pressures and crippled by war, there's no place that needs a strict order-based rule of a man like our General Secretary Moore. Yugoda will lead us into a strong future where one day the people of Russia will no longer need to fear German bombers, fascist puppets, or cowardly bandits. In the name of the motherland, our people march united. United in an unstoppable march of progress towards those bright horizons where the light at the end of the tunnel lies. If you like to read about that, please go ahead. So soon of, so soon of uh, this, hold your head high and sing out to the world that Russia is not yet dead. For motherland, for order. For this bread, we thank thee. Nice. Oh, and, you know, you peaced out with these guys, and what did you expect? That just, they're just going to be nice? Cool. Secure the re rural regions. Next, we must secure the rural regions. The fields are the home of any good revolution, and the collectivization of the agriculture is a vital step in the course of 
of revolution. Also, due to the autarkic nature of the economy, a more reliable agricultural supply would do us well to supply the needs of our urban population. The valiant soldiers of the motherland shall sweep the rural regions, wipe out traders, and bring order back to a great union. We will rip out the rod of reactionary and liberal thought from the ruins of the USSR like a farmer pulls a weed from his crop. There's no space for dissent against the vanguard party of the Soviet Union. The world awaits, comrades. Ora, oza, rodinu. Nice. Poverty? Oh, yes. Yes. Very good. We want to purge them, but we're getting close on the case. The People's Commissariat of Defense have been visited by the NKVD many times before, but never by this many officers. Desk drawers were pulled open, leave files were leafed through, and people were questioned in droves, and above it all, two men stood firm. Nikolai Golubev, Golubev, a giant of a man with enough feats to his name to make him notable, even if he seemed to have nothing but indifference to many of his superiors, and Anatoly Denisov, a thin officer who once was once a very ideological commissar. Two cousins, bound together by the order of Genrik Yagoda for a single investigation regarding missing funds, and so far both had not found much yet. You're certain you have no recollection of where these missing funds have gone, Nikolai spoke calmly, as he eyed a brief set of files. Does this imply incompetence on your part, or does this imply a colleague's responsibility? Well, the bureaucrat began. After a brief gulp, I'm fairly certain I saw Gennady skulking around. Anatoly raised a hand, cutting him off. Comrade, Gennady stated he saw you skulking around in the evening, in fact. He promptly filed a report implicating you as a suspect, instead of waiting until now to divulge this. Tell me, why would you want to wait to divulge such crucial suspicions until you were filed into a room for questioning? A brief pause filled the air as Nikolai looked up from his files pointedly. My colleague asked you a question, he boredly stated, as the bureaucrat slowly looked at them, then the door. For a moment, he looked like he was going to attempt to run. This moment ended when a pistol was whipped against the side of his face, while Nikolai reached to a small bag at the side of his chair, withdrawing tools, tweezers, a cigarette lighter, a small pair of blades, and a pair of scissors. Where has the money gone? The line of questioning continued for 17 more minutes. Ooh, that sounds kind of painful. Just a little painful. But, we owe the unwatchable, unstoppable march of progress. A letter of repentance. Uh, to Senior Lieutenant of State Security Nikolai Golubev, Junior Lieutenant of State Security Anatoly Denisov, General Secretary of the USSR, Genrik Yagoda. <clears throat> Comrade, I have wronged you. I recognize that you have every right to be angry with me for a single moment of weakness. However, I have repented entirely for my anus actions. You may doubt, you may disbelieve, but I initially took the funds to be used elsewhere to benefit the Union and different departments. I see, however, that my idealism did not bear fruit that I thought I would sow instead. I entered into a den of ruffians, corrupt monsters, and those who would seek to bring the revolution astray. Thankfully, two brave and intrepid investigators aided in my repentance with a brief visit to my home in which I realized how far I had been led astray. To ask for forgiveness is a challenge, though I offer this. In exchange for amnesty, I will fully cooperate and give the names and addresses of those I know who are involved in the den of bourgeoisie corruption. I will retire from my life within Irkutsk and promise to cause no further troubles in my future years. I thank you, General Secretary, for your never-ending benevolence and understanding and await your reply. At least he's willing to talk. After some convincing, restore the ASSRs. One of the great decisions of the USSR was the establishment of the autonomous Soviet Socialist Republics that allowed the minorities of the Union a larger degree of freedom in a land dominated by majorities. We believe this practice must be continued if we're to consider ourselves the extension of the Union and so these ASSRs are to be recreated to allow the ethnic minorities of our state autonomy. We hope that in making this decision we grow ever closer to attaining the legacy of the USSR and perhaps gain even some legitimacy amongst other Russian states as a legitimate heir to the Soviet Union for the motherland. Case, case closed. Yagoda was used to late nights in his office first. Under Bukharin, he had spent countless hours documenting and dealing with the man's enemies. Then he had spent time running the Union as it fell apart, and now, once again, he was here, waiting. Silence reigned for a moment before the phone on his desk rang, and he picked it up. Report. The General Secretary spoke as the two voices jostled for position. Comrade Yagoda, the raids have been a stunning success. All the conspirators have been arrested or dealt with then. Anatoly, shut up and let me talk to the General Secretary. The other voice spoke as a brief bit of murmuring between the two was heard. Right, Nikolai reporting. We have three dead conspirators, one dead officer, two injured officers. One attempted to flee and was shot. One attempted to kill the men sent to investigate him. And the junior lieutenant thought that the third conspirator had nothing to say. <clears throat> He was reaching for a gun, Anatoly muttered across the line as Genrik sighed, the informant. Resettled it to Cheetah and given a small stipend for his time, far more generous than the others in the embezzlement scandal will get. I assure you, General Secretary, that all the guilty parties will be held responsible and their associates monitored. I do not want there to be a chance of anyone slipping the net, the General Secretary interrupted. Of course, why, Nikolai and I will be personally see to it. Anatoly replied with such noise and zeal for a moment, you go to almost imagine the thin man was giving a salute in the middle of wherever they were standing. I will expect your full report tomorrow, he murmured as he hung up. And so the General Secretary retired for the evening, and while in the distance, Nikolai Golubev looked at his partner and gave him a slap. 
Nikolai and I will personally see to it, will we? Thank you for adding even more to our plate at this late hour, comrade. Relax. All that's left is mopping up. That's all. Just, just a little mopping up and we'll be fine. Maintain cultural restrictions. Sponsor the arts. Well, we do want to get more state influence, so as much as we want to sponsor the arts, we're going to maintain cultural restrictions. Ruby technology yet? No, we do not. And it's... Hey, that's actually went down a little bit. Look at that. Nice. Hey, we have 20 and then 1 out of 20. Not bad. We're doing quite well here. We love authoritarian socialism. Russia has been infested with many vile creatures over the years since. <clears throat> Our nation came crumbling to the ground. It is only due to strict policies on the part of our government that these reactionaries, capitalists, and traitors have failed to find their way into the mainstream political life of Irkutsk. Instrumental in holding back the spread of these movements and their ideals through Irkutsk has been the NKVD, ever watchful over the safety of our citizens and the revolutionary movement in their steadfast vigilance. However, as we spread our movement and reclaim what once was, some have begun to suggest dangerous ideals, such as that we lift these restrictions on culture and allow our people to freely express themselves. This is simply preposterous. We see again and again the results of an unguarded populace, the creation of reactionary regimes that have enslaved Mother Russia. We cannot allow this to take root in our nation instead. Movies will be reviewed before showings, newspaper articles will be heavily censored, and only art deemed appropriate may be put before the public's eyes. Onwards, my friends. Let's libertarian socialism support. As it should be, my friends. As it should be. Back in the AS ASSR. Imperialism is merely capitalism in decay, wrote, wrote Lenin. And the imperialistic conflict between nations is nearly as important as a class struggle to this end. Lenin created the autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic so that even the small, small nationals can express the right to self-determination within the Russian Federative Socialist Republic. Or Soviet Republic. Nevertheless, as the borders expand and more ethnic minorities are incorporated within them, the question of whether or not the existing laws or the autonomy of the ASSRs are sufficient has been increasingly raised. The conservative faction claims that the autonomy they exhibit currently, that is, the ability to draft a constitution within the bounds of the national constitution, are enough. Critics believe that more autonomy, particularly when it comes to economics, must be given to them to minimize economic exploitation of these ethnic minorities by the central government. We must preserve uh, and accept the rights of minorities whenever possible. There is no exploitation in the USSR. Well, we're restricting cultural institutions already. Um, state influence. Oh, my finger slipped. Yep. Oh, well. Revitalize Soviet patriotism. The battle for the reunification of the motherland isn't just fought in the field of battle with guns and bombs, but in the hearts of our citizens. While we vanquish the traitors and restore Soviet rule, it is important that our people are on our side and fully support our campaign of liberation. We must strive towards restoring the patriotism of our people once felt for the union and until in the hearts of every man, woman, and child, you can find an undying love for the country. We draw closer to the finish line, to the day when all peoples of Russia may rejoice, and there will be no reactionary, no fascists, no capitalists, and no traitors that will have reunited this great nation, but the Soviet Union itself. The Workers' Revolution, born in 1917, is still strong, forging an immutable advance towards the liberation of our great country. More authoritarian socialism, more support, a new proletarian patriotism. Nice, and that's exactly what we need and want. And more divisions, that's actually what I really, really want. Socialist realism. <clears throat> this morning, Yagoda announced by radio the expansion of cultural protection measures intended to protect the working class from reactionary influence. Claiming that it is not yet time to allow the propagation of reactionary ideals in society, Yagoda said, the NKVD will continue its duties of minimizing the workers' exposure to them in the media. The creation of the new Bureau of Socialist Media was announced in the speech where films, books, and other forms of media publications will be screened by the NKVD agents before public release to ensure reactionary and bourgeois content is kept to a minimum, which the government believes could potentially indoctrinate the working class with counter-revolutionary ideas. You could have also added that artwork, like posters, paintings, and sculptures will need to be registered with the Bureau as well. Although these measures may seem harsh, these are necessary to preserve social freedoms in a world surrounded by capitalists, reactionaries, and counter-revolutionaries who seek to undermine and destroy the workers' paradise from within, he concluded. Things great are the burden to be endured for socialism. And just improve us. Great. 88 out of 12, not bad. Not bad. And then the proletarian dictatorship forever. Oh, there's not even a description here. That's different. Okay, well, whatever. Propaganda campaigns, we get more weekly stability, and... Ah, it keeps worse, but we got enough PP anyway, so... Add it to the debt. Whatever. That's fine. Because it's still only 1.83, so that's not too bad. Keep improving ourselves. Oh, we got that one done already? Wow, that was fast. Military construction would actually be probably pretty good to do. And then we'll do some more, like, military stuff. Oh, and there goes those guys. Goodbye, Poland. Cool. Not bad. Ooh. Landform? Uh, sure, why not? Mm, hiring for destructors? Absolutely. 
Oh, and repurpose Soviet infrastructure? Sure. More equipment and infrastructure? Sounds great to me. People need roads. The Union marches forward. Cool. And it is 1966, so happy 66. A new proletarian patriotism. Good evening, comrades, said the voice over the crackly radio. We'll be departing from our previous programming in this time slot from now on. Comrade Yagoda well, has widely concluded that these prime hours should be filled with inspirational messages about our beloved motherland. To that end, we have one of the finest Soviet actors in the studio with us tonight to read a war-era poem which is most dear to our Russian hearts. Vasily Alexievich, if you would. The young actor began reading out loud. His voice came in beautifully over the airwaves. Listeners in taverns paused their conversations to incline their ears. Because we are Russian, we just fire and destruction. Are we are all we abandon behind as we go, and fighting beside us, our comrades are dying, and we Russians only face die facing their foe. Aloysia, till now we've been spared by the bullets, but when for the third time my life seemed to end, I st yet still felt proud of the dearest of countries, the great bitter land I was born to defend. Even the most jaded of listeners felt a fire stirring in their hearts at these old words brought to life. Some of the younger ones even began to consider enlisting in the Red Army themselves. And the people were not in love with their motherland before, they were passionately so now. Remember Aloysia, the roads of Smolenshina. Smolenshina. Cool. We got that. Ah, I'll just keep going with this one because you need more output. Output is super, super important. Looking better. Our anti tank is still looking pretty bad. I should really make some millies, but whatever. Ah, uh, yeah, we need more factories. We're going to keep two on the planes, though. I like the planes. We like the planes. Empower workers' organizations? Oh, yeah. Why not? And then we'll finally do the revitalized economic plan. With the glorious reunification of the Far East complete, many celebrate, but the economic theorists of our union are restless. Before them lies the ascension of the Far East economy, a duty many would see as fit a little more than punishment. Or see as little more than punishment. But this Herculean task is necessary for the union's future prosperity, and perhaps even to survive on the coming struggle of comp a complete reunification. When it's done, a new economic plan is to be drawn. As the plans of old, it will define the roads road to social success that our citizens shall follow in order to achieve victory and the struggle against the imperialistic fascist powers to reclaim the lost homeland of the revolution absolutely yep uh we could uh, yeah we could use more manpower so go do that that's fine the union marches forward as yet another presidium meeting concluded and the members regardless of committees dispersed all felt that a sense of common routine had returned to the union there were many reasons for this, and one had asked around, they would have heard different opinions from different people. Some would say that the resolution of the long-held struggle between the cliques of the party and the state officials had finally brought both internal stability and consolidation. Others said that the reunification of the Far East had proved the legitimacy of the Presidium's construction and had allowed for a true proletarian nation to once again emerge. Whatever the true reason, none could deny that the state was a far cry from what that of only a year, few years prior. Internal divisions had been removed, land had been acquired, economic and social activities were increasing, foreign relations were being established, and providing the means by which all this had been accomplished, the army stood as a modern, professional experience and deadly force. There will be many more challenging and challenges and tribulations in the future. Those who thought about such things knew, but they would be overcome. The people, the government, and the state would act in unison to return to the promise of true socialism to all in Russia. For the Union marches forward forever. The future is ours. So I did cut that one down just so we can slightly get some more, and maybe another division up before we go to war. So we'll see what happens. <clears throat> um. So, oh, way more civvies and millies. Actually, we need that immediately. Soviet armed forces. I'd love to do that. Party influence. Army professional begins to rapidly improve. Slowly begins to improve. Let's do this one. Industrial centric development because we need those factories. Our well, after we get this one too. Our union though. We need to talk about our union. Um. Do we have, let's get better guns first. That'd be good. Our union. <clears throat> Our union brought back from a lifeless state it finds itself in a world very different from the point of its collapse. The previous mixed system of rural agrarianism combined with the industrialization of urban centers is unfeasible within the present economic international realities. In fact, agriculture's contribution to an average country's GDP no longer constitutes a majority. The dominant economies of the world are approaching a model, new model, largely oriented towards the service sector and the integration of recent technological development into praxis. What this means for us, simply speaking, is we need to catch up with the rest of the world. While some plans for rapid modernization have been outlined, it has been decided that the matter should rather be approached cautiously. Reckless transition straight up, straight to a service-based economy will only harm the union in the long run for now. We must go through an evolutionary path and focus on properly restarting the key industrial centers of the Far East. Success has to the past? Great description! I love it! I love it. Echoes of the Siberian plan. I like that a lot. A transitional approach. Expert focus, huh? Partition of the coast. That's okay. Uh, yeah, so equipment goes up slowly, so equipment goes up, and expertise. Equipment, equipment. Uh, a poverty gets, a poverty rapidly goes up, the rival for the sphere. Echoes of the Siberian plan. Important industrial machinery, equipment, will rapidly improve. Industrial equipment begins to rapidly improve. Shipyards get a little better. Um, 
Ooh. So we get equipment and expertise both rapidly, but we get this one, in which poverty rapidly goes up, as well as expertise begins to just improve. And equipment... Ooh. Okay, okay, this makes sense. The state is at dominant, and the party faction. So we have to choose a transitional approach. So that makes sense. We can't do this one, which kind of sucks. I kind of like this one, but whatever. It's fine. Higher and foreign censorship. And state industrial efficiency programs. Eh, why not? Let's, let's reform that. Why not? So, oh, agricultural... Oh, uh, that's really good to do, yeah. Investments for the peasants. While the party might be split over the question of what role the state should have in the process of industrialization, it is largely united when it comes to the policies requiring are required to revitalize the agriculture of the Union. Though the present economic plan is largely centered around industrial development of urban centers, the quotas for predominantly agrarian rural areas have gone up as well, and several initiatives for intensification of their economies have already come up. One more ambitious proposal is to survive the machine tractor stations. Local enterprises for ownership and maintenance of agricultural machinery, established in the late 1920s. These will allow the underperforming solve causes to modernize with state investment, and leading to a considerable increase in agricultural output. Nice. Efficiency. Viktor Molchanov arrived at the armaments factory early in the morning. He had worked at the Palant since the end of the Great Patriotic War, having been part of a Red Army detachment charged with escorting the Presidium to the Far East. Life under the guidance of General Secretary Yagoda had been better than one would expect. At the very least, Victor could say he was employed and his family was well fed. Victor took his position on the line and began the monotonous job of assembling artillery shells. Hours passed by, ha passed by with little incident, and yet he could not help but think but that something was different. It was a small thing, easily able to be missed on the line, but something was different. Another few hours, he, After another few hours, he understood. The line had been going much faster than it had been before. A few words exchanged with his foreman cleared things up as well, apparently, as the foreman relayed to him. Some of the inspection points have been eliminated in favor of a more efficient pace for production. It couldn't help out of mixed feelings about these new changes. As the day dragged on, he felt like he was falling behind at first. The new pace was easy to handle, but the further the day went, and the worse he felt. But as he left the plant at the end of the day, he could not help but worry about the quality of some of his work. I only hope no one gets hurt. Ah, things happen, you know. And then better agriculture, because we love agriculture. And compromise on imports? Even more agriculture? Yes, please. I did say I want to do land auction, but whatever. We already have the best parts of our current land auction already finished, so. Compromise on imports. Ever since the bitter defeat of the Union and its relocation to Siberia, the question of protectionism dominated the disputes regarding matters of Soviet agriculture. With the soils of the Far East far from fertile, especially when compared to the fields of the Russian plain, a certain amount of products will have to be imported, potentially harming local pop production. Now, with the Far East reunified under the rightful authority of Comrade Yagoda's government, this question rises again. Fortunately, the Union's economists have found a compromise solution. It calls for a complex system that ensures import contracts are scaled in accordance with the fulfillment of the economic plan. This policy, if streamlined properly, will encourage domestic production of goods that will otherwise be imported without devolving into outright autarky. Which is good. Oh, 20 and 8? Sign us up. Yes, please. And then, a transitional approach. With the recent doctrinal development uh, cementing the role of the state in the economy, calls for fully implementing this principle in the existing economy are beginning to grow louder by the day. However, many within the party are opposed to what they view as a betrayal of practices established by Bukharin, to whose Siberian plan our government owes much of its current assets. To, uh, assets. Assets. Yeah. To prevent a disastrous split within the party, Karmadi goes to devise what he calls a transitional approach to economics. It has been described as a set of conceptual principles that pragmatically amalgamates major aspects of Lenin's and Bukharin's economic theories with Yagoda's own thesis. It declares the present state of the U Union transitional between a market system and, and developed true socialism. And thus, it guarantees the position of both the state and private enterprise, satisfying both factions that have emerged over this dilemma, and bringing over the age of transition. Nice. Very nice. Petition of the Coast. Let's go ahead and do this one first, because we get more infrastructure. I like infrastructure. So... Form the special economic sectors. Some of the economists within the government recently came up with an intriguing proposal. They suggest some regions be designated as special economic sectors with free market type regulations, flexible trade policy, and tax incentives to promote the concentration of capital and technological investment. While initially proposed as an alternative to economic zoning, this initiative gained traction within the party with pushing for adopting both policies alongside each other, arguing there would be mutual benefit from cooperation between the new types of economic autonomies. Comrade Goda sees no reason to object. We get infrastructure, air bases, naval bases. And for both Magadan and Tugoro Chumakansky. Not bad. I think that's great. I love improving society as much as possible. And then inviting 
Invite Boeing. Great. Among the foreign corporations who expressed interest in allocating some of the assets to the new sectors provided for the investments by our union, the Boeing company seems to be the most indecisive, which has caused considerable difficulties due to our own aviation industry being quite underdeveloped. While the large distances between our urban centers create a sizable civilian aviation market, and the applications of the military developments are obvious, the world's largest aerospace contractor sits on the fence, reluctant, reluctant to cooperate with us. Evidently, the entrepreneurs behind Boeing distrust the proclamation of the transitional approach that we made. As a policy is normally a temporary measure, it deters them from investing, fearing they would lose the funds when the transition to a fully state-controlled socialist model comes in the future. We must convince them then, along with various other investors, that we are not planning on returning to war communism anytime soon, and that their investments in the future of reunion will pay off. <clears throat> Partition of the Coast while political decentralization served us far from well in the past, it will do us no harm to divide the underdeveloped regions into separate economic zones, this will naturally rationalize the local management of the economy, increasing awareness of the problems in each given area. But the greatest advantage of this policy, and the ones we're after, is if we use the precedent of these zones' autonomous bureaucracies and we can establish separate economic legislation there. This would allow us to selectively loosen restrictions for foreign trade and investment, without compromising on greater national trade policies, while still bringing foreign capital to work developing our backwards regions. Conveniently, the region that would benefit most from this is the Pacific Coast, with the zones that are drawn from around the urban ports, already promising centers of international trade. Very nice. Very, very nice. And we're moving very swiftly through this, which is awesome as well. Military factories, absolutely. Spend, spend, spend. 29, not bad, not bad. We'll definitely need to get more cities here. And I'll get more millies eventually as well, so don't worry about that. And invest in transportation will be very good too. For academic base, we have basic literacy. Oh, yeah, it's better research. Good, 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 good. So we're, I want everything down here done as fast as possible. Because this will just help our output. Look at that. Less than a thousand pieces of artillery needed. Two a day. Anti-tank, we get almost seven a day. Minus six. Less than 700. That's actually not too bad. And when we get to the next stage, we will get some tanks as well. Right now, I just don't think we have the numbers for it. And by Boeing is nice. Actually, for these guys, they are not even 20 combat with, which sucks. So you guys looking not too bad right there. Um, good enough. There you go. And we'll do this one. Partition of the Coast. Great. Followed up with invested transportation. Of all the land of the former Union, our government managed to reclaim the Far East, and while the region has a proud history of brave settlers taming the frontier and partisans fighting reactionary tyrants, it was regrettably neglected by previous instances of leadership. It was a largely a backwater peripheral region in the days of the Empire and was often underinvested under -invested into even by Lenin's administration. Governor Bukharin did have plans for renovating his economy as part of the Siberian plan, but they, regrettably, came to pass only partially, as the Union was ultimately shattered. The century's worth of neg neglects consequences are most prevalent in the transport sector of the economy. It has been, in fact, determined that the regional industrial potential great greatest limit is the capabilities of the infrastructure, which are, even in the best cases, below satisfactory. Thankfully, the transitional approach takes transportation into account, with the new economic zones granting funds and economic authority to make the necessary investments into transportation facilities to achieve the goal set in the greater all-union plan. Nice. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I got better guns! Who doesn't love better guns? Ooh, we don't want to get that one yet. Let's get better trucks as well. There's so much to research. We actually have more divisions. At least one more. Nice. Because these guys are going to be very difficult to beat. Rurik is not easy to beat. So much manpower. Quite a few divisions. I hope we can hold out against these guys. Actually, since we're here, since we have it paused, eh, it doesn't really matter. Let's do that one. Thank you. Nice. And let's get some sort of air force and let them train for now as well. That'd be nice. And then arrival for the sphere. One key factor that many analysts have, and economical theorists of the Union have continuously brought up since the time of the Far East reunification. <clears throat> There's a greater international picture we now find ourselves in. Our main concern is the imperialist ambition of Japan. Over the years culminated in the foundation of the so-called co-prosperity sphere. A periphery of satellite states clearly aimed at the exploitation of the resource and peoples by Tokyo. Unfortunately, as a dominant power in Asia, their empire theoretically enjoys a degree of influence and far might far above the unions. However, in actuality, the sphere is a crumbling structure, built to inspire all but not to last. Recent developments have shown that its diplomatic alienation deprived it of developing trade partners. Which, in combination with bureaucratic incompetence, has significantly damaged the sphere's economic potential to the point where we can directly compete with them on the international stage. By putting our efforts towards actively toppling Japan from its seat of economic power in Asia, we can both benefit from replacing that position ourselves and undermine one of our most dangerous regional competitors. After all, the bright future of our union's economy shall be all but assured. Nice. Or more output for dockyards? Okay, not bad. Uh, this stuff is okay. But poverty begins to rapidly improve. Nice, nice, nice.
Good stuff, my friends. Good stuff. And 16 divisions. Heighten foreign censorship? Why not? How do we get more state influence, though? The list. Being a regulatory officer was no picnic, and our man knew this well. Media had to be analyzed by the people up top, and they needed to regulate what he was told to keep from letting into the country. Same as the others he worked with. It could be books, films, it could be anything the Japanese were making. It was all jotted down on a single small little paper, a list that was placed down on his desk every single morning. Sometimes. It was simply a copy, while other times it was a new one. By this point, every day was the same to Ah Man. He'd wake up, eat breakfast, bid goodbye to his wife, go to work, and return home in the late hours of the night. A cog, that's, that's what he was. A simple gear in the apparatus of state, working day and night for a pension he never seemed to have the time to use. More items were labeled, more items were censored, and the list always arrived at his desk. His wife tried to understand, he and his co-workers occasionally went out for drinks, but he would always find himself at his desk, accepting orders from above and relaying them down below with a little fanfare. An easily replaceable cog if he stepped out of line, some of his co-workers had already vanished and been replaced. Perhaps Irina and him should take a vacation. A single brief respite. He owed it to her after all, yes. As he lay in his bed for the evening, his wife slept on the other end and he realized a vacation was exactly what they needed tomorrow. When he was done with the shift, he would ask for time off. So he went forth the next morning with a large smile, stepped into his cubicle, and eyed the piece of paper already laid on his desk. The list had been doubled. With not even a sigh, he got back to work. <laughs> oh, man. And Paris of Siberia. Oh, that's so good. More political power. I should have this one earlier. Well, we lose consumer goods, but whatever. The city from which we reunify the Far East, Arkutsk, has a glorious history and was one of the most developed even before the old Union's demise. However, what's, what once was known as the Paris of Siberia had come to be a state of disarray. Many of its buildings were not up to the present standards, its streets unoptimized for modern traffic, and its universities and industries archaic and obstructing the greater economic plans we have we have for the region. It seems that much like its namesake in 1853, the Paris of Siberia will require a series of renovations to become a modern urban center. While some comrades suggest postponing it until we can control, again control all of Russia, Comrade Yagoda has ultimately decided that this renewal will be vitalized, or be vital to the process of reunification itself and authorized to start it sooner rather than later. And urban development initiatives. With the recent drive to renovate Irkutsk, plans for similar projects in other cities of the Far East have been brought up by the regional committees and individual urbanists of our union. While the present situation necessitates the majority of them to be put off, some of the ideas concerning major centers have been cautiously accepted by the according authorities. These initiatives cover mostly matters of infrastructure, ensuring both better transportation within the cities between them and between them. Few that accept the proposals also deal with the education system, aiming to enhance its facilities to prepare a future scientific base for the union. And then we'll do redirect the transib and invest in egalitarian schooling and education is the future. Nice. Just in time for everybody to finish stuff stuff off. Nice. 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 <clears throat> Civies first. Nice. 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 We're doing quite well. I would say we're doing quite, 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 quite well. Invest in egalitarian schooling. It has become evident over the course of reunification that in modern warfare, military technological developments, and significantly that that significantly influence the outcome of the conflict. Many theorists within the party have thus turned their minds to optimizing scientific output to further the reclamation of Russia by utilizing new advanced armaments and ensure our union's prosperity thereafter by developing civilian applied technology. One obvious method for that is to develop the academia extensively through the recruitment of new scientists. It has thus been found detrimental that in the spirit of proletarian egalitarianism, potential intellectuals of all sexes, nationalities, and backgrounds should be provided the necessary education and resources to conduct research for the benefit of the Union. If we're to achieve this, first we must direct our efforts towards eliminating the new, the few remaining prejudices of the education system. For instance, minority talent initiatives can be used to ed educe those of ethnicities typically glossed over by higher learning. Very cool. Very good. And resources? Yeah, why not? We could probably extract a few more. Actually, can we buy some more? Oh, and there goes those guys. Let's grab some from Japan for now, and one from the Hungary, why not? Well, actually, let's just do one. There you go. Not bad. We're still looking very, very good, so. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And technology, actually, how is supplies? Because we got, the only thing we're lacking really is manpower. Oh, we've got more than enough guns now, look at that. Artillery is still pretty bad, and anti-tank is not great, but still. But even planes are looking relatively okay. Let's go down to three, though, for now, because we could really use at least one more factory on there, so. Not bad. Actually, really, really quite good. We're going to need quite a surplus of guns, though, for um, other stuff. Frontline Um, For when we had to take over enemy lands and had to put down partisans and rebels, so. Pretty good. Pretty darn good. 
redirect the transit. One problem we face when managing urban developments is the Trans-Siberian Railway. While its existence is greatly beneficial as the main axis of transportation between the cities of the Far East, the transit only covers the southernmost areas of the Union, economically alienating areas unconnected to it, including the pr prosperous ports on the Okhotsk Sea and resource-rich inland districts of Yakutia. While Sakhalas Oil and gas reserves need a little more than pipeline for Magadan de facto our main port. A railway connection is vital. Thus, it has been found necessary to start constructing a new branch of transit, going north along the Pacific coast. While extending a railway through the depths of Siberia is no easy task, and some are already dubbing it the construction project of the century, due to its difficulties of the initiative, the task itself should be relatively simple to achieve. And we get even more infrastructure? I love infrastructure. Please, more, 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 more. And then, education is the future. What little flaws the education system once had, we have eliminated. Thanks to our efforts of both realizing the Marxist principle of equality and enhancing the quality of education in our universities and life in our cities, the Union is entering a new age of knowledge and higher learning soon. Even the most optimistic predictions will be surpassed, and Soviet society will truly enter the technological age. Of course, this utopia of a proletarian mind will not come by on its own. The academia must double their efforts on the cultural and scientific front of the new revolutionary struggle, and with their sweat, a new future for the people will be forged. As such, the Union collectively, and its Every citizen individually must strive for the better to better their education, for it is their future, their future and our future. And we get more political power, we get more costs, but that's okay. More po monthly poverty. Day. Oh, another division. Awesome. Okay, now I feel pretty good about this. This is not too bad. We should do relatively okay against these guys. And we have no manpower. Oh, I guess again. Nice. Awesome. I love it. Education is the future. And something happened there. No. It's still... Hi! Happy 1967, everyone. It's June. Oh, we've been in 67 for quite a while now. Oh, well, go figure. 238 people, not bad. Yep, they're gone. Oh, well. Things happen. Not bad. Pretty good. Pretty darn good. And money-wise, we're at what? 1.83 billion? That's pretty good. Propaganda? Why not? We can. Indonesia defeated Indonesia. Good job, Indonesia. And the Soviet Armed Forces, home of the revolution. Um, we'll do the Soviet Armed Forces next. Good, so we're all the way down here. Resources are coming along. That's really good. Uh, we didn't do, do, get any bonus for land doctrine yet, so we'll wait first. Get some better aircraft. Why not? The Soviet Armed Forces. When uh, Voroshilov and his sycophants elected to cower in Hungos instead of joining the Presidium's evacuation to Rakutsk, the Soviet Union's hammer sickle found itself without a hammer for the first time since the revolution. Gonward's proud tank corps, artillery battalions and air wings, presuming the general's uh, vainglory, all rent into bone fragments and scrap metal along the AA line. Subsequent struggles against the reactionaries and the revisionists further chipped away at the armed forces until only what remained of the NKVD and auxiliaries flew the Red Army's tattered banners. Suffice to say, the Union has recaptured much of its glory since. Its reinvigorated position in the Far East has brought in our options, for likewise restoring the Red Army's invincible might. Yet, we must not dally in doing so for Comrade Yagoda eyes Western greater threats to the revolution of the bandits and petty warlords. These states' armies will offer us no respite or quarter. In due time, neither shall we to them. Nice. Just go click on everything here. Just build everything up. Just build, 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 build. Doesn't matter to me. How do we get more state influence, though? Hmm. But, we'll probably do it through this one. Yep. The Soviet Armed Forces. More, and we get Parade Day. Nice. We love Parade Day. We should get another increase in some sort of society development soonish. But the guard, Guardians of the Revolution. The Red Army has never strayed from its principles despite its diminished state. Great Lenin sounded the call for the people's militia, intrinsically intertwined with the class conscious, to protect the revolution. Hence did our generals raise militiamen from Moscow to Irkutsk. Their bayonets were rusty, their rifles antiquated, and their ranks a far cry from the thousand battalions of Premier Bukharin's time yet. The Union's conscripted soldiery never, nevertheless protected our proletariat, as an old buckler shields its owners from cuts and crippling blows. With a new glut of resources at the Union's disposal, we can now reforge our worn splintered buckler into the unbreakable aegis that it once was. Soon the Red Army shall meet its foes with tanks, automatic weapons, and fresh divisions of disciplined fighting men. Good. Even better trucks. We love the trucks here, because we need the best trucks for the Far East. 1.87, not bad. 17 divisions. Pretty nice. We could use that manpower. It's only 5,000 extra manpower, but whatever. Increase GDP, I guess, a little bit too, which is fine, whatever. Oh, civilian administration, we gotta keep spending. Because now we get 2.68 every single day, which is pretty nice. Hey, 6.9%. Nice. Not bad. Even though the debt's rising quite quickly, but whatever. Guardians of the Revolution. Beautiful. 
Spray Day. But we'll do this one first. Empower workers organizations? Yes, please. As the Red Army marched below the balcony, celebrating its recent triumphs and the state's campaigns of unification, the ranking officials who stood upon it knew the monumental decisions were fast approaching, ones critical to, to, to the future. Whether civil or military, all were aware of the struggles for control between state factions, and whatever the status of that struggle might be in the civilian government, it had not been determined within the Red Army itself. On the one side of the argument stood the NKVD, who, as some of the only loyal forces who had accompanied the Presidium to Rakutsk during the evacuation, claimed that they should be increasingly militarized to serve as the loyal core of a future army. On the other side stood the professional military apparatus of the Red Army itself. They countered strongly by reiterating that they had remained loyal during the Sablonite Rebellion, and cast doubt on the combat capability of the NKVD, claiming that to restructure the military to accommodate them would lead to an enormous decrease in both tactical and strategic performance. None knew what the outcome of this argument already underway amongst the highest echelons of the government would be, but they did know that, in the coming days, they were to, sure to find out. An uncertain future for the Red Army. Pretty much. And a co-equal branch. <clears throat> No matter the fortunes which have been fallen our union, the good men and women of the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs never strayed from its side. They had loyally fulfilled their duties since the October Revolution and continued to fulfill their duties even when threats flanked the motherland's every vulnerability. So strong is the NKVD's sense of purpose that it even preoccupies itself with responsibilities beyond its charter, like supplementing the Red Army's equipment and manpower with its own. It would be remiss of us not to acknowledge that their loyalty simply because of our situation has improved. Hence, the Presidium of the Soviet Union has decreed the formalization of the NKVD's, NKVD's de facto status as a separate branch of the Soviet Armed Forces. With this elevation comes a secure place in the Union's annual defense budget in addition to a large say over military affairs, <clears throat> appropriate recompense recompense for a state organ that has proven it's worth time and time again. Beautiful. And purge them, finally. Nice. An uneventful evening. Sergei Bessonov was late to the session of the Presidium, although one could easily justify it by Yagoda's seemingly abrupt calling of it, and not a single bit of warning given on it. Secretary, General Secretary Yagoda now, he was called, had left a sigh, a sigh left his mouth for what was the sixth time today, day, all as, as he thought about how things were becoming. Traffic was terrible, and the NKVD checkpoints were stifling as always, but by the time he had finally made it to the Presidium, he had decided something needed to be done. Even if Yagoda had eyes everywhere, even if he only grew stronger by the day, he needed to do something, but first he needed to rally the others. After he got his guard at the door, who kept looking at him, shaking his head while blocking his path, Comrade Basanov, while your service to the Union has been faithful and an admirable example, I cannot let you pass, Sergei blinked, and just why not? He asked as the officer blinked, confused. Comrade, you were promoted to the Bureau of Agricultural Advisory. Another representative has been selected. Sergei barely heard the rest. Was that why he hadn't been informed of the meeting? A promotion? He'd been promoted as the others, no doubt, funneled off, moved out of power, and shuffled to where they could not even touch him. Where the thought of Sergei Basinov moving against Genrik Yagoda wasn't just laughable, it was non-existent. And as and so, as Sergei Basinov began to sob, and the guard confusedly looked around, unsure what to do, the general secretary gave a single passing, sm small smile from the window, before striding into the chamber of the presidium, not even bothering to glance back at the entrance. The party's over, and there's much work to get done. Beautiful. And to do this, we have to be at 69, I believe, January 1969 for the reunification of Russia. And it's lagging so hard. What is... Ah. Nice. Well, it is what it is. Uh, this, oh, this usually happens 67. Uh, isn't it beautiful? I love Africa. It went kaboom. A co equal branch, though. Hybrid training programs? With the new equipment comes new problems, as quartermasters and strategists are wont to say. Ours now suffer from this peculiar curse with the reintegration of old luxuries. Heavy armor and air support in particular into their divisions. Like a dilapidated truck left to gather dust for the lack of fuel forgets how to combust its engine. The Red Army has forgotten how to fight it like a proper army. The Ministry of Defense has begun addressing this issue twofold. First, by expanding the Union's military academies so as to accommodate lessons in tank and aerial warfare. And second, by organizing exercises which involve elements from all branches of the Soviet armed forces acting in tandem. Practice makes perfect, so too will it make an invincible force in the Union's hands. And we go to combat schooling, we get more army professionalism change, uh, division of defense and attack go up, mobilization speed goes down, and more minimum army training level, which is totally fine with us. Tactical reassessments. Um, anything here? Oh, air wings. Let's see, this seems all okay. Uh, any for land doctrine? Oh, it's down there, I guess. We'll go for that one. Tactical reassessments. With the Red Army's largest formation shrank from military districts to half-strength divisions, its planners emphasized small unit combat over simultaneous uh, front-wide attacks. When the Red Army's air wings plummeted one, one by one in Barbarossa, its planners disregarded 
their power as a force multiplier altogether. And when the Red Army's heavier assets, tanks, helicopters, artillery either stay behind the Urals or defected during the Siberian War, its planners utilize trucks with small arms to great extents. Shifting circumstances, after all, warrant a shift in priorities. If you would like to read about industrial expertise, please go right ahead. Excellent. Now the Soviet Union has regained much of the factories it had lost. Rearming our divisions with armor and fire support will take time, but the average division will eventually enjoy unprecedented levels of available firepower. We should reprioritize our war plans accordingly. Absolutely. Absolutely. 2020? Nice. Uh, how's this looking? Oh, we have mass mechanization. Nice. Yes, that's good. Uh, we should get that done by the end of the campaign. Modern mechanization, so that'll be good. And then procure anti-tank equipment. Our men are steadfast, tough, and hardy in battle. In the face of armored units or hardened fortifications, however, these traits mean nothing. If our men can't damage these hardened targets, we will not be able to engage enemy armor on equal footing. Fortunately, there are many stockpiles of anti-tank weapons that have not yet been exploited. We need to go out and collect as many of these weapons as we can for a fledgling army. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it looks like maybe we might actually be able to, uh... Well, that's getting hard. 7.6% is not too bad, though. Um, complete our focus tree before we actually 69 appears, 1969 appears. Wow, up to 30 divisions, that's a lot. We do have 17, which is pretty nice, but still. Oh, and there goes those guys. Goodbye. Oh, wow. Well, they're falling apart over there, which is great for us. But let's get those blueprints for asymmetric s strategies. Conventional warfare in Siberia is nearly impossible for us to wage. The front lines are simply too long for the amount of soldiers we are able to field. Mobile units able to act on their own will be what wins us today. Able to coordinate over the endless tundra, our men will be trained to fight in the harsh, barren conditions. Hit and run tactics will be emphasized, and our men will be taught how to operate effectively in small units. As we have for years, we must make do with what we have, and perfecting our use of asymmetrical tactics will give us a much needed edge over the other warlords. Absolutely. Abso positively lutely. Ah, better jet engines is good. We could get better planes. I think we'll have some better artillery too. Hit them just a little bit harder as well. And we'll have more resources very soon to deal with. Actually, resource wise, we're doing. Oh, let's get one more. If you like to about better academic base, please go right ahead. And poverty! Look at that! Nice! And you wonder about fear and loathing in LA, please go right ahead as well. A toast for economists, great! Something to be celebrated, and it's different, I guess. Thumbs up for me, man. Thumbs up for me. That's only 2 billion now, not bad. We should be mobilizing a little bit more as well. Effective total manpower is due to is 153%. It's pretty nice. So we're all along here. We'll keep going for more resources because we can. I like resources. 2 billion is not bad. After that, we can do all this stuff, but it doesn't really matter too much. Yeah, XP is nice and all, but the home of the revolution. Russia was the first nation to embrace the revolution of the proletariat, and despite all the challenges and setbacks she has faced, the motherland is still leading the charge. With her hold over the Far East secure, the time has come for the Soviet Union to formally re-enter the world stage. Though much of our union remains in the hands of warlords and traitors, we cannot wait for total reunification before approaching it or reaching out to potential allies and partners. Russia has suffered from diplomatic isolation for too long. As a home of the workers' revolution, we must lead by example. We cannot set an example for the workers of the world if we are just seen as another warlord, rather than the legitimate successor to Bukharin's Soviet Union. The movement that began in 1917 never ended. We've recovered our momentum, and the time has come for the Soviet Union's triumphant return. Absolutely. Australia, let's, let's grab some of that, too. Even better trucks. We have the best trucks here in Russia. The Far Eastern Russia, at least. So, not bad. We're missing artillery. Other than that, we're missing manpower. We got a lot of anti-tank now. Wow. That's actually really good. We can probably cut it down by maybe one. We'll cut down both of these by one, maybe, for now. Really help out with artillery just a little bit more. Home of the Revolution. Follow up with develop the Merchant Marine. The first steps of rejoining the international community will be engaging in international trade. Siberia is a rich region with bountiful resources that many foreign nations are eager to have access to. The North does not provide everything we need, however, which is why it is more important than ever to be able to trade with the outside world to import important materials like rubber. Some might say doing business with capitalist empires is a betrayal of the revolution, but the revolution won't get very far if our trucks don't have wheels. To facilitate opening trade with the outside world, we've arranged for the purchase of a hundred merchant vessels suitable for hauling large amounts of cargo. With this fleet, we can kickstart a new Soviet merchant marine and import all the resources that we can ever, ever need. Cross Pacific. Increase Japanese co cooperation. Ooh. Request American recognition. Ooh. Back on the world stage. Workers. Peasants and soldiers of the Soviet... Union of Socialist Soviet Republics. We are about to embark on the return of the workers' state to the world. 
The eyes of the oppressed see the red banner hoisted it once more, and their hopes and determination rise with it. We shall soon stand side by side with those who share our ideals in all that stands against Nazi tyranny. We'll bring about the re-liberation of the, all the Union, and destruction of the fascist jackboot on our people and freedom of all mankind in a socialist world. However, this task will not be an easy one. The reactionaries are many, savage and relentless in their desire to see the worker state extinguished, but the tide has turned. The dark days of the 40s and 50s are behind us. Our enemies will not succeed. History is on our side as it always has been. Now, as we take our first steps back onto the international stage, I will say to our diplomats that I have full confidence in your skill, your devotion, and your loyalty. You shall be the vanguard of the revolution from abroad. To, from today onwards, and the oppressed nations of the world are no longer alone. Genrik 1 a.m., or 1 p.m., 1 a.m. probably, 20th of February, 1968. Our victory is inevitable, and we'll finish off with reading Peaceful Coexistence. Our end goal might be global revolution, but for this moment, it is not just practical to pursue this. The world dominated is dominated by three giants, America, uh, Germany, and Japan. Of the three, Germany is clearly the biggest threat, while America and Japan embody corrupt capitalism and tyrannical imperialism, respectively. They hate the Germans almost as much as we do, and we will, so we will tolerate them for the moment. The word allies is too strong for what we want. A better term might be collaborators. America and Japan would benefit from a strong Russian nation to oppose Germany, and we would benefit from foreign aid for our quest to retake the Union. As long as this state of affairs continues, it makes more sense for us to pursue peaceful relations until we are prepared for more direct confrontation. But if you enjoyed today's video, please do consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below if you haven't already, and I will see you tomorrow as we will continue to march west and defeat all the reactionaries, capitalists, and imperialists. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.